one of the things with human beings is that they have a past, that there is a history before them. And this is very much the case with the Buddha. You see, it is, it is pretended in most modern writings on Buddhism that the Buddha invented everything. You see, on one side you had the Hindus, and except for all kinds of evil, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything right. And then came the Buddha, and then suddenly all these blessings came down. And um, because the Buddha had invented them. Well, that's not at all how it, how it went. Not even in the very limited domain of meditation. You see, the Buddha himself learned meditation at the feet of several gurus. And this is all described. These gurus are also named. The techniques are named. And two of the techniques he learned by two gurus, they are the two last meditations in the Buddhist curriculum. They are the last but one and the last dhyana or meditation technique before the awakening, before the bodhi, before the nirvana. So they are not at all being rejected by the Buddha. They are being included. And then perhaps he added something more to what he learned. You see, a good pupil doesn't stay a pupil forever. At some point he has learned what there is to learn and then he goes on and adds something himself. Again, that is what normal human beings do. That's not so special. And Hindus are perfectly allowed to do that. So he continues the Hindu lineage that he is part of. And he adds something more, yes. And then he founds a new institution, which of course many Hindus have done. Shankara has founded the Dashanami order, for example. And so the Buddha starts his own order. And that is the main new thing that the Buddha has done. You see, he has started an order that didn't exist before, that venerated someone, namely the Buddha himself, who wasn't being venerated before. That is entirely new. About the teachings of the Buddha, there may be some new elements. It is possible that the Vipassana technique, you know, that is now very popular, was indeed invented by the Buddha. We don't know. It was practiced by the Buddha, that we know. Whether he was the first to practice it, I don't know. I, I think it's beyond, uh, beyond investigation, really. But, you know, I wish good luck to everyone who wants to try. But at any rate, it's part of the whole tradition of meditation, of pursuing liberation or awakening or how you want to call it. So it is again nothing new. You see, in Christianity, in a Christian world, the Buddha could not have started pursuing bodhi or nirvana, because there was no concept of bodhi or nirvana. You see, for that, he had to be in India. Here there was already, you know, and we find testimony of it in the Upanishads, there was already a culture of pursuing you know, liberation or awakening. And so he said, okay, you know, the techniques of others are not sufficient. I'm going to add my own technique, you see, and teach that. And found an order in which I can, you know, teach that. So that's not a break with Hinduism. In the life of the Buddha, of which, on which there is a very large literature, there is not one moment where he says, here I break with the Vedic tradition. It's just not there. So, there is very much a continuity between the Buddha and anything that went before. Many concepts in Buddhism are already present in the Upanishads, sometimes in germ form. Um, and so there is a certain systematicity, but even the systematicity is a bit older than you might think. For example, there is a Vedic thought form that you find in the Nasadiya Sukta. Nasadiya comes from Na Asat, not non being. And this is the verse where it is said, you know, in the beginning, 
there was neither being nor non-being. Now, this is a thought form that is used all the time by the Buddha. You know, I'm not saying that God exists and I'm not saying that God does not exist. And if you try to be clever and say, ah, but in a way God exists and in a way God does not exist, he adds, you know, using the same thought form but multiplying it, two times two is four, he says, okay, God does not exist, he does not not exist, he does not both exist and not exist, and he does not neither exist nor non-exist. Okay, but he is continuing the same type of logic that already went before. And then later Buddhist thinkers have developed this further, you know, and then you get a discipline called Buddhist logic. And so, of course, as time passes, as human beings use their brains, there are new developments, things get better, get more sophisticated. You know, this is, you know, just perfectly allowed to say in Buddhism, some interesting new developments have taken place. But to say that this is new, this is Buddhist, which Hindus did not have, that is not correct.